Hello my tarts and hussies, it's Carla, and today I'm making miso brown butter tomato tart. And I'm gonna start with the dough. If you've ever seen me make dough before on the channel, it was probably this dough. And it's the flakiest dough. I don't really mess with any other method. You don't need a food processor. You don't need anything except your hands and a cutting board and a rolling pin and a bench scraper. You need a bench scraper. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to start with a stick and a half of cold butter. A stick and a half is the same as six ounces. And because this is an eight ounce block, I'm just going to weigh it to make sure. And let's see if I can nail six ounces six on the dot. That's gonna go into the tart dough. This other four ounces is gonna show up later as brown butter. So for these, I've changed the recipe. I've been working with this recipe for like five or six years now. And over time, I'll like do something slightly different. So today, instead of cutting it into table size pieces, I'm gonna do it in these little rectangular like planks. So this is half of a half. So if this is a stick of butter, cutting it in half and then cutting each half into a half. And you'll see when I roll it out, kind of having it rectangular to start, it's gonna keep it rectangular and it just helps with the folding. Another little change I've made is that I'm gonna add sesame seeds to the dough. So there's actually gonna be sesame in the flaky pastry and then there's sesame oil in the tomato mixture. It looks really pretty and it's another layer of flavor and it's a little bit crunchy. So like live, learn, laugh, grow, change, evolve. You need a cup and a half of flour. My cup is the King Arthur flour cup, which is 120 grams. So I need 180 grams. You could also do this by scooping and leveling. I love a scale, not for myself, but definitely for my dough. 180, <laughs> just on the dot. One of the things that you see a lot with tomato tarts is like they tend to go very Mediterranean, the world of tomatoes and basil and oregano and marjoram. A lot of tomato tarts that you'll see will kind of follow that flavor profile. If they don't, they tend to go like American grilled cheese. So for this, I was actually inspired by the tomato soy vinaigrette that's in summery grilled corn salad. Great recipe, great vinaigrette. And tomato and soy, are fr they're just really good friends. They're in the umami party club. Sesame seeds are in. I need a little sugar. The little bit of sugar helps with browning and it also will help balance out all the other like savory flavors that are happening with the brown butter and the soy and the whole situation. The other thing, and this is also a change to the base flaky dough is I'm adding a little bit of baking powder. It's gonna give the crust like a little bit of openness, a little bit of like airy, like that like light crunch. It's also gonna be flaky and tender and delicious. Also adding equal amount of salt to sugar. Obviously you have to have salt to make everything taste good. Salt and sugar together, power couple. And that's it for the dry ingredients. First step is just to combine everything. And then I'm gonna add my little butter planks. And this step is really tossing the butter with the dry ingredients to kind of coat the butter because I'm about to dump it out onto this work surface. And if the butter is coated with the dry ingredients, it's less likely to just like stick straight onto the thing. All right, so you could use a wooden cutting board if you have a big one. You can do this right on a clean countertop I have marble, I sometimes do it on wood, you could do it on formica, it doesn't matter. But this is what's different from a lot of doughs. We're not in a food processor and I haven't cut the butter into small pieces yet. It's still in these planks. I'm just gonna start rolling and the point of this is to roll the butter into flat sheets. You should definitely use chilled butter, but if the butter is too cold at the beginning, you might have to like work it a little bit more before they soften up. This temperature is great. It's already starting to roll out into these sheets. So totally normal that something would stick. These are starting to get thin and flexible. I'm gonna go thinner than this. And then the pieces of butter that are at like the front where I haven't gotten there, they're still in these chunky cubes and that's totally fine. You wanna pull off the butter as you go, corral, go over it again. Okay, so I have my beautiful butter sheets 
And from here, I'm gonna use the bench scraper. You could use a big spatula if you don't have a bench scraper and just kind of corral everything. Some of them might break in half and that's also fine. They don't have to stay in that ribbon shape for very long. I'm gonna make like a little area. I already had ice water icing down. I like to do this because recipes will say like ice water, which you can't really get from the tap. So when I am starting and gathering my ingredients, I just get the water really, really cold and I need a quarter cup, no ice. Just hold the ice back. If water escapes, we're just gonna corral it back in, but just wanna evenly pour ice water over this mixture. And the reason things need to be cold when you're working with a flaky dough is because you want the butter to stay in some pieces without smushing and just completely homogenizing. And those pieces of butter are what is gonna kind of turn into steam and air pockets later. So that's why there's like a lot of attention given to keeping things cold, just as for hot hands also. This is a tossing to distribute the water and kind of like feel like things are more or less evenly hydrated. Now I've got this crumbly mixture. There's some bigger clumps. There's some more dry bits. Totally fine. Everything is great. So now I'm gonna roll out again. So if you've ever made puff pastry, some of this technique is gonna look similar. Rolling and folding is basically giving the butter more chances to become a sheet again, to get sandwiched with flour. You fold it over. Something that was one is now two roll it out again, you fold it again, and that creates layers. It also is just, to me, gives you so much control. When I do this in a food processor, inevitably I over-process my dough, I, all of the butter gets smushed into the flour and I don't get the flakies. It's rolled out, it's loosely rectangular. It's like a gorilla's back. <laughs> so I'm gonna give it a little shape. It's not gonna fold because it's so PC and loose right now, but just take the top half and fold it to the middle. Don't worry about all these crumbs, just put them over there and then go from this side and go to there. It's falling all over the place, it's loose, it's a little bit like dry sand castle, but that's okay. And then just zhuzh it 90 degrees. And then from here, I'm just gonna like be a little more suggestive with it. Like you're gonna have to, Tame your loose ways, you little hussy trollop of a dough. And then go again, okay? Same exact thing, rolling it out. I'm pretty comfortable with this dough, but if you feel like, oh, things are sticking, take more flour, flour down your pin, extra flour in the dough is gonna be fine, and just roll it out. So there's still like these butter sheets, they're getting thinner and thinner, they're almost translucent. Some of them are a little thicker and a different shape. It's starting to look a little bit creamy in certain parts. So again, taking the front to the middle, crumbly valley, and then this way to that, and then again, turning it, okay? So if you have little loose bits, invite them to join the rest of the folks here. And usually for me, this third pass, I call it, is, is where it, comes together, it might need four. So this is number three, roll it again. And so now that rectangular shape is it's being more cooperating, as we say around here. The edges are slightly still crumbly and a little bit dry, but I'm kind of looking at this, you know, 80% here, which feels like it's together. It feels really smooth. It looks homogenous. Now I wanna get this into a disc to put into the fridge to chill. So you could do this a day or two before you wanna bake, or you could do it that day. Folding it over, still looks crumbly, but the process of getting it into this disc is you're still working it. If you watch the video about frisage, different video, you will know that smushing together the butter and the flour is like the last step in the recipe for making a lot of doughs. And that's like a French technique, it just means to like smear. So in this process of getting it into the disc, I'm still working it. So if I were to, to have rolled it out before I started doing this, it could get too soft, it could get overworked. So it's like kind of just the right amount of work left to get it into this disc. 
So that's it. So while the dough is chilling, you have this perfect amount of time to make your brown butter mixture that's gonna be the dressing for the tomatoes that's gonna become the filling. So that remaining little piece of butter that I had from before is going into my adorable vintage Le Creuset. Thrift, I can't even say it was thrifted. It was free on a stoop and I just took it. And it has the hollow um, handle. They don't make these anymore. How, come on. It's the cutest thing you ever saw. Aww. It's perfect for this amount of brown butter. So your whole process for brown butter is probably gonna take six or seven minutes. Don't rush it, don't crank the heat, let it take its time. It's a little like caramel. You want it to melt, you want it to move through its stages. And the first stage is like a very happy big bubble blattering. And that's as the liquid from the butter is cooking off, you get the big noisy happy bubbles. As the butter continues to cook, you'll see it gets a little bit quieter. That's the phase when you actually wanna be stirring and make sure that you go all the way to the bottom of the pan because the butter solids are gonna to start to form there and you don't want them to burn. So you're just scraping them up so they can keep moving around with like the fluid butter that's still cooking. Okay, so when it's done, you're gonna see it. It's browned. I was just gonna let it cool down in the pot, but I it went a little bit further than normal. So I'm just gonna pour this off. Pouring it off into a, a, another vessel is gonna help the butter cool down more quickly, which is actually what we want because I don't wanna combine it with the other ingredients when it's piping hot. But you can also see like the beautiful brown color of the butter. You can see those milk solids that have also browned. So my butter is cool. For us, this is this flavor universe for the beautiful tomatoes. I am building this up starting with ginger, which I did a couple versions of the tart and ginger was like, I think the third time I did it, it all goes. So I ended up adding and it's really, really nice to have that like bright, fragrant energy with the tomato, tomato and ginger, obviously great. Ginger soy, ginger sesame, like we're in a really good world. And I want about a teaspoon. You could use a mortar and pestle or you just finely chop this. Okay, so that is our ginger. And I've got soy, it's like one and a half. Toasted sesame oil, same deal. Teaspoon of fish sauce. If you don't have fish sauce, you could use a couple of minced anchovies. You could use a little bit of anchovy paste. If you wanna make this vegetarian, vegan use vegetarian Worcester sauce. And I've got a light miso, I think light or yellow miso is the best choice here. Red miso is delicious, it's just more, more flavor forward, it's just a little more intense. Um, and I want a tablespoon of that. I think the recipe says to whisk this all together, but you can just sort of paddle it together. So if your miso is super cold out of the fridge and your butter is still a little bit warm, when you mix this together, you might see the butter seize and like get chunky. Um, and that's just the, the temperature change and nothing to worry about. It will smooth back out once you add the tomatoes. This is one of those times where the amount of tomato that I'm calling for is actually important. Finding that right balance between the temperature of the oven, the crispiness of the dough, and the amount of liquid that the tomatoes are gonna throw off naturally, and the amount of liquid that we're adding to them is a little bit of a deli cat balance. I'm calling for a pound and a half, try to use a pound and a half. A, whole, a, a nice beefsteak tomato, like a big juicy one in the summer, this almost weighs a pound all by itself. You can also like mix and match a little bit. Mm -hmm. It was a pound and a half. I'm gonna cut these half an inch thick. Use a serrated knife. I feel like a serrated knife is something everybody should have for bread and for tomatoes. This is my Victorinox, we love them. This is the reality of developing a tomato recipe out of season for where I live. Even with all of these things that I'm trying to solve for, in season tomatoes are gonna be even juicier. So it's sort of like, this is the thing about ingredients. They, they change, sometimes they're sweeter, sometimes they're juicier, sometimes they're really big. Sometimes you go to the store and the onions are gigantic. So trying to solve a little bit for the ephemera and the, 
the uncontrolledness, <laughs> not a word of nature is, is tricky. What I ended up doing is I added a little bit more breadcrumb into the tart than what I actually used during development to try to solve for the future of juicy tomatoes. I can't control everything. I can't control how much juice is in your tomato. Um, but I feel, I feel really good about it. And I think if you at home are cutting up a tomato and you're like, this is literally an explosive water balloon of a tomato. I've never seen such a juicy tomato in my life. Then add another tablespoon or two of breadcrumbs and just cover. Cover your ass and cover mine. My dear friend, Andy Barragani, who just got married. Happy wedding to Andy and Keith. But Andy had a tomato tart that he developed when I was still at BA. And in his, he tosses it and seasons them and then he drained off the liquid. And like, I love Andy so much, but draining off tomato liquid feels like a punishable offense. So I just, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't do it and I didn't do it. All right. While we've been talking about tomatoes, the butter cooled down all the way with the help of its other friends. And you've got this kind of like creamy peanut butter texture. Um, it's all gonna smooth out when everybody gets together. And that's nor obviously it's normal. It's just that the butter, butter is solid when it's cold. I think the best tool that you can use for tossing is your hands. We don't wanna bruise our tomatoes. We don't wanna smash them. We don't want to implode them. So just tossing gently and it smells really, really good. It's going to smell even better when it's in the oven. So I'm going to let these sit just for as long as it takes to roll out the dough. Today's dough has been chilled. I'm going to unwrap and then talk about some choices as far as your baking vessel. You can use a nine or a 10 inch tart pan. I recommend something with the removable bottom. These are not very expensive at all. You could use a pie plate. My experience with pie plates is that all of my crusts slump down into them. I don't get a great edge. And so I am just pie plate averse. But if you're a great pie maker, 100% that will work. All right. Lightly flouring, lightly flouring. If your dough is very cold when you first take it out, giving it a few smacky smacks just warms it up. And we're going to have cracking, okay? Cracking happens. It's going to happen. I'm not gonna freak about it. So now we're rolling. We're going for about 13 or 14 inches in diameter, depending if you're in a nine or a 10 inch. Trying to go round. I always end up with a weird square or a rectangle. But one of the secrets that I learned from my old friend, Chris Morocco, is if you turn the dough like a quarter turn, almost like every other time you roll the pin, um, it, helps, it helps you get a round shape. It also is a way to prevent sticking because you keep moving the dough and you kind of will become aware sooner rather than later if anything is sticking. And if anything is sticking, it's just because a little bit of butter has broken through its flour encasement, right? And if that happens, you just lift it up and do a little scatter underneath. It could stick on the top and it'll stick to your pin. Okay, so things are going great. Obviously I have like some Grand Canyon over here, but that's, that's okay. We're just gonna position it in a way where it ends up on the side. It feels like properly hydrated. There's a little bit of dry bits, but that's fine. All right, so this is definitely 14. I'm going a tiny bit bigger because this crack, it's a little bit deep. So I just wanna give myself a little bit of real estate so that this crack ends up on the side. But I'm gonna pat, I'm, we can patch also, so that's all good. And then this is the right thickness. I mean, what is that? It's, it's half a centimeter. So I have my pan. Some people fold in quarters. Some people roll onto the thingamajobber. Some people lift. Earlier today, I folded, and I sure wish I had folded right now, but it's all good. See? Should have folded. <laughs> I'm doing it again. 
Some people fold and some people roll. <laughs> and I'm a folder. <laughs> 100%. So just try to get the center to the center. Okay. That crack is gonna haunt me for the rest of my life. I can't even look at it. That's okay. I said at the beginning, did I not say cracks happen? We're not gonna stress about cracks. And then look, here I am. And I have to deal with it because you can deal with it too. We're gonna deal with it. It's totally fine. <laughs> it's fine. Okay, so what I'm doing right now is I'm propping up the edge of the dough just so that I don't tear it. And I'm using my knuckles to start to find where the wall meets the floor. Carpet meets the wall, we're in good shape. It's nice and flat from the top edge of the tart pan to the floor. If it's a hammock, it's gonna slope and there's an, you're, you have an air pocket under there. So how are we gonna deal with this? I have two cracks. I have the Grand Canyon over there. And I have a small little divot over here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull some dough from that edge and I'm gonna put it in there. We don't want tomato liquid underneath the crust, pooling, burning, creating a soggy situation. That's done. I'm gonna take another little piece from over here and I'm gonna put it right there and I'm patching that hole. Later, we're not even gonna know it's there. Okay, gorgeous and beautiful. Do you believe me? <laughs> Do you believe me when I say it's gorgeous and beautiful? So now, operation liquid interference method. Breadcrumbs, not toasted, dry as a bone. This is panko, you can use any kind of a breadcrumb. This is like putting in a gravel before you pour the foundation, is that a thing? Anyway, that's there. The other thing is this is gonna become a delicious like layer. And then I'm also using some more black sesame seeds that are gonna get toasty and nice and mixed in there. They're gonna be a little bit absorbent, but really it's the breadcrumb that's gonna absorb liquids. And then I'm just gonna take some basil. What I couldn't get my hands on, but would be amazing would be Thai basil or opal basil or black basil, which goes with some more of these Asian ingredients that I've used, but you could also 100% use chives. You could use cilantro. You could use tarragon. You could add a little bit of mint in there. And so for the basil, I'm just gonna cut like a little chiffonade, not too thin. And this also goes in the bottom. The flavor of the basil is gonna permeate through, but I'm keeping it on the bottom because basil, when it bakes, oxidizes and goes kind of brown. The oven is already preheated to 400. I'm using the toaster oven. If you got here, the dough is fitted in here, but you're like, it's really, really soft and warm now, then pick this situation up and throw it in the fridge for 10 or 15. I feel pretty good about it not being hot. Cool hand Luke over here. I'm just starting with the bigger tomatoes. Forgot to say this, but when you're doing your breadcrumb, make sure that you go all the way to that edge where the wall meets the floor, because when I fold the crust over, it's gonna create like a little roof and it's gonna prevent liquid from evaporating like under where it folds over. So you just wanna make sure that you've gotten your breadcrumb all the way to the very edge. This looks nice. I'm sure a food stylist would have some notes for me. This liquid, that Andy Baragani threw down the dumpster drain. <laughs> I'm gonna use, and I'm just gonna pour that over. I just feel that it's a lot of flavor. People work very hard to like make tomato liquid. And I just feel like it should be part of this. So it is. Okay, so here's where the world of a tart kind of meets with the world of a galette. Cause I'm taking that rustic edge. I'm just folding it over to make my tart edge. You don't have to, if you want a really clean edge, you can go around <clears throat> with a paring knife and just shave off all of the overhang. But I'm like, you worked hard to make that crust, so just keep it. It makes this like extra double, double crust. And who doesn't want more of the crust? Okay, she's beautiful. So now you could use 
heavy cream, half and half, milk, you could use a beaten egg, you could use alt milk. Just something to brush on the very top edge of the dough. This will help it brown, it'll give it a little bit of shininess and it'll just look a little more finished when it comes out. Do a little seasoning, the tomatoes, just flaky salt, because we're fancy. I do recommend before you throw this in the oven, put the tart on some kind of rimmed baking sheet. And this is gonna start at 400 degrees to give a nice high heat burst at the beginning. It's gonna help the crust um, puff. It's gonna help it start to set and then lowering the temperature for the rest of the cooking to drive off the rest of the liquid, cook the crust all the way through, brown the tomatoes, and that's that. It's not enough for the tart to be done. The tart also has to cool. Like any other tart or pie, if you cut into it, when it's hot, juices are gonna go juicing. This is baked, this is cooled, it is gorgeous. There's two ways to remove the removable bottom from the tart ring. One is the impatient and dumb way. And that's where you would just like perch it up on your hand and then you would figure out how to put it down on the surface without breaking the crust. Take a bowl, anything with a rim, and you put your guy on top, and then the ring falls down, and then you can just pick it up. I don't recommend taking this whole thing off of the bottom. Put it right onto a platter like this, or a cake plate, or whatever it is, and it's gonna stay on that. I think it's pretty with a little fresh basil. You would do this like right before, and it's just pretty contrast. The flavor's already in there, so it's also kind of cueing the people having it that like, oh, it has basil. And then originally, I just topped it with extra sesame seeds. I've made this three times now, and there's lots of other things that would be delicious, including furikake. Um, I feel like this is very complimentary, and it's a little salty, and it looks really pretty. Another trusty Victorian ox. I wouldn't use serrated for this. We wanna get like nice clean cuts. No droopage. No, we're not soggy in the center. We have integrity, nice and crisp, holding together, gorgeous. Mmm, mmm, such a flaky whore, she is. Mmm, 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 mmm. Breadcrumbs soaked in tomato liquid, studded with sesame, filled with delicious aromas, fish sauce, soy, First tomato tart I ever developed. First tomato tart that any elite New Yorker was thinking about actual tomato season for half of the country, just as for early tomato season growers and enjoyers. And also my first tomato recipe of 2024. We're, we're celebrating, we're living, we're learning. We're flaky little tarts and hussies. When I worked at Shake Shack, one of my great daily accomplishments was that in order to make the frozen custard milkshake, it was 10 ounces. See how I still remember this? 10 ounces of frozen custard for a shake. And if I could scoop it out of the ice cream thingy and throw it into the scale and it was exactly 10 ounces, it was just like, oh, it's gonna be a great day.